We know that virtual coaching has become more competitive than ever. NASM's got you covered with our virtual coaching course. NASM's virtual coaching course provides a complete solution to help you translate your services into a successful virtual platform. This course will give you the tools to build and operate a sustainable virtual business model. The formats may be different, but you're still delivering fitness training and effective behavioral coaching. That doesn't change even if you can't be in the same physical space as your clients. The truth is, this is the way to reach more clients and expand your reach and impact. There's never been a better time to carve out your very own virtual space, and NASM is here to help. Welcome to NASM's Virtual Coaching. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, new Master Instructor Roundtable. I'm Marty Miller, and we have my fellow Regional Master Instructor here, Ms. Wendy Batts. Wendy, how are you today? I'm great. How are you, Marty? Couldn't be better. Thank you. So we are excited. This is kind of part two. You won't see that on the slide here, but we are going to talk about low back dysfunction. Our previous Master Instructor Roundtable was what we would call flexion intolerance. And this week we're gonna talk about extension intolerance. And if those names are new to you, don't worry. As we go through the webinar, we will dissect those very technical terms into what you've seen throughout your coursework here with NESM. But going back months ago, Wendy and I talked about a lot of different topics, but you know, we always had that uh, going back to the kinetic chain checkpoints and all those issues about watching the low back arch or low background, excessive forward leans, and more and more people continue to ask about low back dysfunction. And then part of it is, I remember when I was doing more hands-on training, I'd have clients come and say, hey, my low back hurts. Tell me the one thing that I can do. Clearly, we know there's so much more to it than that. So this is why Wendy and I decided to break it apart into two different major movement compensations and dive deep into each one to hopefully give all of you a better understanding between extension intolerance. And like we said last week, we did the flexion intolerance. So Wendy, you're working with clients each and every day. Is there anything you want to kind of throw out to our uh, NASM family here before we get started? You know, what I think just the main thing about what we're going to cover today is I think Personally, this is one of the most common compensations that I, I have to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't matter if it's a professional athlete or a, you know, a business executive or just even a mom, a stay-at-home mom, because you know, obviously there's so many common um, patterns that we do throughout the day that it doesn't matter um, you know, what they're doing, but there's certain muscles that are going to remain overactive and certain muscles that are going to become underactive if things are not identified and corrected accordingly. Yeah, Wendy, I think you made a great point. We've both had the privilege of working with elite professional athletes. I know you still do. That's the majority of the people you work with. And I think sometimes there may have been a misunderstanding earlier on when we first got in the industry that athletes move well. They, they don't move yeah. any better than any of us. They can just compensate better and they can elicit more power and stamina and they can do things to a much higher level, but they're still doing it primarily, unfortunately, on movement dysfunction. That's where as an athletic trainer, I went to school because we were trained to treat all these injuries that occur. So I just kind of like to, to put it out there that, you know, if you've never worked with an elite athlete or you're aspiring to, or you are, do not think that just because they're explosive and powerful and they're great at their sport, that they're going to move any better than anybody else you take that has been maybe, you know, not exercising for 10 or 12 years. Well, in my personal opinion, I think that they might actually come in worse. And uh, just because of the ground and pound that they put on their body daily in their sport, um, especially in season, no matter what the sport is. And again, not saying that they don't do some, you know, exercises or different programming and stuff throughout the season. It's just it may not be very specific to a, you know, a very uh, clear and, you know, progressive type of assessment, um, you know, where we, we gather so many different information, you know, so much different information on different sure. levels by doing different things. And so, um, you know, people always say, if you work on this, you know, this type of athlete, how do they feel out in going into phase one? And in my personal opinion, I think phase one and phase two may be the hardest yeah, because they, their body knows how to powerfully move 
but it's slowing it down and getting the right muscles to fire at the right time and the right plane of motion is very difficult for someone, especially if they've never done, you know, the NASM, uh, you know, OPT model type training before. Yeah. And I think you made a great point in, you know, I don't want to just cruise right past it, but you know, all these athletes that play these sports, the way I like to say is they don't do it because it's good for them. I worked with professional baseball players. So everybody was throwing and no matter what you do, throwing is probably one of the worst things you can do for your shoulder. So clearly they're going to have these overuse patterns in these movements and they do hundreds of thousands of them sometimes in a course of a small period of time. You know, you work with golfers, you work with NBA guys that are jumping and landing. So it's just that cumulative volume. But, you know, we can learn a lot from our lead athletes and, and you know, help everybody across the board because we both like to say everyone's an athlete. We're going to treat them like an athlete and we want to improve everyone's movement dysfunction and as you were saying, here is one of the most common compensations we're going to see with the largest percentage of people that we assess. So I'm looking Absolutely. forward to jumping into it with you. Absolutely. Well, if we look at this, this, this slide isn't going to be anything different because again, it's, you know, we're actually taking the pelvis and going a different direction this way, this time. So when we're talking about extension and tolerance, we're saying that when people go into even more extension, it becomes more painful. So the statistics of over 80% of the population are going to suffer from some low back, what people have termed as pain, but what we like to say is discomfort because obviously we're not in the scope of practice to deal with pain, but we absolutely can help with discomfort. Um, you know, that, that's gonna happen to like 80% of the population sometime in their lifetime. And unfortunately, a lot of it can be repeated over and over throughout the years. And sometimes it becomes even more progressive. And so again, as we're talking about extension and tolerance, what we're doing is thinking about, and you know, I kind of used this analogy last week, but if we have the, the pelvis, it should stay, you know, we're talking about the lumbopelvic hip complex. So when we're looking, you know, in the five kinetic chain checkpoints, again, we look at the feet, the knees, the hips, the shoulders, and the head. So when we get to the, the actual hips, if you're thinking of your hips being a pail of water and you tip it out the back, that would talk about posteriorly tilting, which is what we did last week. This week, what we're focusing on is the anterior pelvic tilt, which is where it's going to go in a forward position. And so, you know, again, as I said in the very beginning, I think this is a very, very common compensation. Sometimes it gets, you know, it, it gets overlooked in the assessment, you know, the assessments. And it's mainly because we do have a normal curvature in our spine. And so the thing is, is people are like, well, you do have a curve in the spine. How do you know if it's more than what's normal? And the thing is, is that's when you start to play around with your client's hips, have them tuck their butt under, have them come up and then have them try to find what they term as neutral. And then you can determine, is it more excessive when you're not going through that and you're looking at it visually? Um, so, you know, to me, I think the most common, you know, um, common people that we see it in is people that sit a lot, which unfortunately now being in front of technology more and more each and every day based on what we're coming off of or still in, in, in the COVID world um, that has actually increased, which low back pain has also increased, but then also people that are st still super, super active. And, you know, I, you know, in, in this example, you and I put in runners, because again, think about all the hip flexion motion that someone's constantly having to do. So, you know, we know that when you sit, your hip flexors are shortened. But think about this. Every time you bring your knee up or your leg up, you are in a hip flex position. And if it's a constant over and over and over, it comes back to that repetitive movement that you were just talking about with any kind of sport or athlete. Um, it will eventually take its toll. And those muscles will remain in a shortened position, causing something such as this. Yeah. And two two great points to, to or two great things to add to all the awesome points that you made is, you know, Sometimes somebody is already in a natural anterior tilt before you even have them do an assessment. So I've seen some personal trainers maybe not pick it up because they're looking for an additional movement. But if somebody's already starting in an anterior tilt, that is the compensation. As they squat, they may not go into a further anterior tilt because they live in an anterior tilt. So always make sure you're checking that. And as Wendy said, have them go anterior, posterior, find the middle. So at least you can see can they control that movement? Do they have the ability to disassociate their pelvis from the rest of their body? And you'll be stunned. A lot of people, they have to move their whole body to try to get their pelvis moving. 
but again, make sure that uh, they're not already set up in that so you don't miss it. And then Wendy, you and I did a, a great, I'm going to say great core <laughs> um, <laughs> webinar a few, few months, weeks. I'm, I'm lost with COVID now, but we talked about a lot of the core exercise that people think are core that are really hip flexion dominant. Mm -hmm. So I think if you guys are wondering, we may not cover all that. We may get into some questions here, but we already covered a bunch of that and how to pick the right core exercises to make sure you're not feeding into a pattern that somebody may either have just gotten out of or is already in to, you know, we want to make sure that we're correcting things, not feeding into something. Absolutely. And, you know, and again, you know, every time we talk about, uh, you know, the core, we talk about stuff, especially when somebody has this, you know, this type of, of intolerance and extension intolerance or an anterior pelvic tilt. I mean, basically what we're trying to do is we're just trying to get that, that, neutral position of the pelvis back. And so when we tell people to draw in or try to, you know, brace depending on, on what you're, you know, what you're doing and what your client can handle in the very beginning and then squeeze your glutes that usually helps kind of minimize that. And that's why we focus so much on it, you know, throughout our training, especially in phase one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I just think it's so important. And, you know, if you can clean up this anterior tilt with people who have it, it's amazing how much everything can client to clean up. I'm not saying not to address everything, but you know, when somebody has a really, you know, predominant anterior tilt, they're going to know it and they're going to feel it for sure. Oh, and, yeah. You know, it's it's something that uh, you will you will elicit a pretty quick response from them, you know, in, in the sense that they will just feel better because everyone wants to get that low back, you know, in a better position for sure. And then oh, I, when we talk about performance, we'll get into all how it aligns all the other muscles, of course. And I do want to kind of make a note before we even move on. You know, there's so many people these days that are saying, I really want a big, you know, a big back end, if you will. And, um, you know, some of some of the people that we see that are famous that have very big back ends, obviously, those have been enhanced. And a lot of times we take that, uh, you know, I wanted to throw that in there, because sometimes people actually train for that. And mm -hmm. uh, the thing is, is you can still work on your glutes, and you can still work on different, um, you know, different ways of, of, <laughs> of looking a certain way. But there's yeah. a big difference between trying to look a certain way and actually being able to move correctly, and obviously minimize low back pain for sure. Absolutely. So. And, and what I would say to that, Wendy, too, is just as you're talking about adding that in, you know, <laughs> don't confuse hypertrophy with proper function. So a lot of people, they see the response from a hypertrophy standpoint, but that does not necessarily mean that they're still not moving compensations there. They just might be stronger, but they're still even though they were able to get those glutes to hypertrophy doesn't still doesn't mean they're not using their low back a ton and their hamstrings, et cetera. So, you know, let's make sure that we're always looking at function, not always the cosmetics of the muscle. Let's see how it performs. Yes. And our producer just made a comment about Sir mix a lot. Exactly. So yes, we all like big butts, but we want to do it with a, a nice, uh, neutral spine. Yes. We want to function correctly and we want this spine to be neutral. So and I'm a miss. I, I got to get better at my intros. I, how did I forget Greg, Greg, forgive <laughs> us. You know, uh, without yeah. you, we're not here, Greg. That's right. <laughs> he is the man behind the scenes as Princess yeah, always exactly. does. So, <laughs> but that actually brings us to, you know, what, what is an anterior pelvic tilt? What is this, you know, extension intolerance? And, and again, it is when somebody already has an anterior pelvic tilt and if they actually go into even more extension for some reason, and, and even just the everyday movement in life, it causes even more compression and pain. Mm -hmm. And so what we want to do is like, we look at the five, you know, put the individual in the five kinetic chain checkpoints. And again, on the anterior view, we're really focusing, as we've said, and as you see in the book, about really seriously just the feet and the knees. So you're not really noticing the tilt until you turn them into a lateral position. And so if someone is standing there and you have them raise their hands over their head in, in getting ready to perform the overhead squat, you may already see that anterior pelvic tilt happen as soon as their hands go over their head. And so that's just you're marking it and they haven't even moved yet. And so, again, um, you know, that's that's one thing to note what happens to their lower back, if anything, when arms go overhead. And then when they squat down, does that arch actually increase? Can you see more of an arch, um, you know, as they go down? And so there's two different ways of looking for an anterior pelvic tilt. What happens when the arms raise? And then once the arms are raised, what happens when they squat? And so. When you think about that and you're noting that, you really want to focus on what muscles are overactive. And as we've said multiple, multiple months now, um, if a muscle is overactive, 
those are the muscles that are causing the compensation. So again, it's the ones that you want to focus on when we talk about, in which we will in the, in the next few slides, but what we want to focus on lengthening. And then when we talk about the underactive muscles, we're talking about muscles that are allowing that compensation to happen. And Marty, do you want to talk through some of these muscles and, and how sure. it happens? Well yeah, so when we look at the hip flexors, you know, that's a generic term for a bunch of muscles. Obviously, we have our psoas major, our iliacus, our rectus femoris, our TFL. You know, there's multiple muscles that flex the hip. So we're just limiting that down for this slide to one muscle group. And if you really love to know the anatomy and to there is ways to know which one is causing it or multiple, definitely look at taking the corrective exercise specialist because we dive deeper into the, those uh, muscles because again, you would got to execute the right type of program. So you may have to stretch more of your TFL or more of your psoas or more of your rectus for more. So again, we're not here to discuss that in depth today, but you know, just want to talk about when we say complex. And then your erector spinae, those muscles that run up from your lumbar spine to your cervical, but the lumbar erector spinae for sure can, you know, I hate to say it this way, but I've always said, give you that pelvic wedgie where it pulls you into that anterior tilt. And as Wendy said, your lats, they start in the thoracolumbar fascia in your lower back they come up, hit your shoulder blade, and then come into the medial portion of your arm. So as I extend my arms over my head, if I don't have the extensibility somewhere, you know, the body will compensate. So if I try to get it, get the extensibility from my, up my arms over my head, you're going to see the pelvis is going to have to tip. And when you see people doing pull-ups or pull-downs, et cetera, a lot of times you'll see them sitting or doing the exercise and they have to go into an anterior tilt because they've gained the motion in their upper extremity so their lats are like, hey, if I if I can't get above my head and you want me there, I'll have to tip the pelvis to accomplish this. So this is why we say perfect execution of everything we want to do along our continuum. And we'll eventually get people to move better and do things. But, you know, it was funny. I was thinking about this as Wendy, as you were talking. What got me into fitness when I was 16 is I got into, quote unquote, what they would call powerlifting, deadlift, bench and squat. And I always remember I had a great squat for my body weight, and my age. But what always was my limiting factor was never my leg fatigue. I just felt too much pressure in my low back back then. I guarantee you that I had no idea about core stability and all these things. And I was in an anterior tilt. And eventually there was just too much compressive force where it just didn't, I didn't get injured. But luckily I was listening to my body. It's like, you know what? I don't know, think I need to go any heavier. It just did not feel good. Mm -hmm. So these are some of those signs and symptoms that you can ask your clients, you know, where do you feel it? And it'll, you know, besides the movement assessments, you'll get some clues on how they're performing the exercises or even how they feel. Cause not always, you can't always see everything. Yeah. And before we even talk about the underactive muscles, you know, one of the common things that, and especially this is why I love this sp specific webinar is, you know, people are saying, but I don't understand I've got this, but I don't know why my lower back why there's so much discomfort. And it's like, if you look at this picture and you really truly think about the muscles that are overactive, um, you know, your hip flexors, obviously, if you see this gentleman or whatever, he is still, he's in a very hip flex position, right? And um, the, the muscles are shortened from end to end. And if somebody cannot get out of that, then what happens is when they stand up, those muscles continuously stay in a shortened position. And so what happens is if they're going to stand upright, they're going to stand upright. But if they don't have the extensibility in their hip flexors to give them the length in the front, then what ends up happening is that anterior tilt stays because, again, it's it's pulling the front basically of the the uh, pelvis down um, to be closer to the to the muscles. Right. So think about it, it's being put, pulled down kind of towards the quads. And so that's when we say tip the water out the front. But then think about if you're tipping the water out the front and you guys that are sitting here, listen. Or, or, or want to do this, try to think about doing that and, and then tell me how your lower back feels. Because again, remember, you know, we, our lumbar or well, our lumbar spine, or actually our entire spine has those discs that are in between it. And we've got vertebrae discs and, and then vertebrae. And so again, if you can think of the amount of compression and force that you're constantly putting mm -hmm. on the lumbar spine, it's going to be very, very uncomfortable. And if that's how you live life, it's going to be very hard to cue someone out of that without really focusing now on the right progress or the right program to lengthen those areas. But then Marty, if you want to go into why we need to strengthen the other areas to fix that and how that can actually help just relieve um, a ton of pain even pretty quickly. 
Yeah, no, that's that's great. And, you know, I was flipping through some of the comments and we'll get to some of these questions here a little bit later. But there's one I want to bring out right away, because, Wendy, it's exactly what you're talking about. We had a question from Sylvester. What's a good way to strengthen the erector spinae to prevent an injury before starting power lifting programs? So this is going to tie in perfectly. So we use the word strengthening. And a lot of times people think I need to do back extensions. I need to do all these weighted exercise. What I want to say is, Sylvester, with the question is, what is a good way to prevent injury? Because it's really not necessarily, am I strengthening my erector spinae? It's what Wendy said. Am I getting my pelvis in the right position so I have the right length tension relationships? Am I getting my pelvis in the right position so my discs aren't compressed? Can my erector spinae stabilize my lumbar lumbopelvic hip complex with all the other muscles that do that? So when I load my spine in a squatting pattern in a strength phase, that I maintain neutral spine. So it's not necessarily a strengthening. It's more a progressive resistance model from stability, strength, to power. And I can say this with experience because I've seen so many people in the gym when their low back feels weak, the first thing they do is start doing weighted hip back extension exercises, but they're still in the anterior tilt. They haven't addressed their hip flexor. They haven't gotten their glute firing. They don't know how to find neutral in the spine. So really now you're almost feeding into the erector spinae being a prime mover. Yes, you went from maybe a 45 pound plate to a 55 or what, you know, to you know more load, but eventually that's not the best way. So really we want to clean up movement, get the muscles to stabilize that are supposed to stabilize. Then when you're ready to do your strengthening exercises, you won't have those issues or shouldn't have those issues in your lumbar spine. So, you know, I want to address what uh, Sylvester asked because it was really appropriate at the time, but Wendy, did that help cover some of the kind of the thoughts you were putting out there at the same time? Well, yeah, and, and to your point, if you keep doing back extensions and anterior pelvic tilt, again, think about the amount of compression and force that you're putting on, on your vertebrae. And so that's why we see so many people having low back surgeries, whether it's, oh, I've got, you know, a, you know, or not even surgeries, but just issues. Like I've got low back bulging discs between, you know, this and this, this, you know, or I've had to fuse these together, or I don't have movement in my sacrum, you know, like little things like that. It's because something is locked up and not working correctly. So therefore, again, when you have a move or a muscle imbalance, one muscle then isn't working the way that it was intended to work. So then all these synergists have to come into play. We get synergistic dominance. It's going to continue this horrific cycle, um, you know, that you, you got to break the cycle. And that's why, you know, to me, this is one of the most important slides. Like you need to understand how do you identify the muscles that are causing that? And right away, how do, what are we going to do to fix those? And then, and then again, the underactive muscles, I mean, you've got your glute max, not a shocker, because again, think about that anterior tilt, the hip or the hamstrings. And again, you know, we, we talked about the hamstrings before, if you're in an anterior pelvic tilt and you guys were to do that right now, again, you'll feel the discomfort in your lower back. But then think about this. If you do that, your hamstrings actually get into a lengthened position. And so from end to end, it's not in a shortened position, but if you feel it, and you feel the back of your leg, you're like, oh my goodness, like that feels so tight. And then you stretch it and you stretch it and you stretch it. But Marty, if you have one end and I have the other end and we have a string and we're pulling it as tight as we can, and then we're like, hey, why don't we add a little bit more? Eventually that string's going to, you know, strain, pop, have an issue, you know, have issues. Because again, it's not in a lengthened position, I mean, a, a shortened position and, and tight because of that. It's in a taut position because it's being pulled from one end to the other. And so the worst thing you could do it with someone with an anterior pelvic tilt, that is very common, is to actually go through and stretch your hamstrings. And so, you know, that's why we see so many hamstring strains and, and you know, like so much stress done to that. And it's literally, if you were to, to lengthen the hip flexors it would and strengthen your, your glutes and strengthen your hamstrings, it's going to help realign and keep that alignment in the neutral position of the pelvis. Yep, absolutely. And that's where, you know, everyone thinks that, oh, something's not working right. I need to get stronger. This is why I always say the OPT model is your best friend. Don't worry about stronger. Don't worry, worry about, am I moving well? Mm -hmm. Let me improve human movement through corrective and stabilization. Then when I move well, I've earned the right to strengthen things. As long as I can keep my five kinetic chain checkpoints in order. Then after that phase, I've earned the right to move more quickly as long as I move well. So, you know, a lot of people, to kind of jump around a little bit and be like, oh, my low back hurts. I, I've got to be weak. Let me start crunching and back extending. And 
usually that's the worst things you can do for it. It's going back to just improving human movement and getting those hips to move and find ideal position and lock that in. Mm -hmm. And then of course, you know, the, the one, the other underactive mu muscle like stabilizers, when we talk about the intrinsic core, and again, you know, Marty mm -hmm. and I talked about doing webinars. We did multiple webinars actually on the core, but that is why it's so, so important to actually start someone with an anterior pelvic tilt in phase one. And the main thing is, is let's say you try to put them in a plank position and they have an anterior pelvic tilt. And you're going to notice when they come up, they don't have a flat back. They can't really engage their glutes, you know, or there's a ton of compensations happening. And so even a plank with someone with a, a major anterior pelvic tilt, it can be extremely, extremely challenging. Um, so that's why it's important to teach your client what neutral position is. And you may have to go through and teach them how to draw in, really spend some time on all of the drawing in and bracing and the different things to really try to engage the 29 muscles that protect the spine first. And then when you engage the glutes, that's going to help maintain the neutral alignment. So when you do add things like the up and down movement in a plank or the up and down movement in a bridge or bird dogs and stuff, you're maintaining neutral spine and teaching those muscles how to play the way that they were intended to play the game, you know? Mm -hmm. So I just want to throw that in too. Absolutely. No, those are great points. It's all about, you know, movement patterns, mm -hmm. getting everything to play like you said, nice together. And then all of a sudden, all these things kind of tend to go away. Yep. Awesome. So we, there we go. So we're going to talk about the continuum now. So when do you want to kind of cover that evidence-based approach? Sure. I mean, I, again, this is something that you guys have not, uh, haven't, you know, if you've watched any of our webinars, Marty and I talk about the CES continuum all the time. And mainly it's because we both use it. We both believe heavily in it. And we've seen so many results um, because we actually follow the model. And again, you know, we talk about the model. We love it because it's evidence based. There's so many different, um, you know, things that make sense. And biomechanically, our body is made to move a certain way. So if we train it the way it was intended to move, obviously, we're going to have greater outcomes. So because of that, and we think of the slide that we showed you guys before, the main muscles that are overactive would be, again, the hip flexor complex, as well as the lats and the erector spinae. So because of those muscles being in a shortened position, those are the muscles we really want to focus on when we're, you know, and going into inhibition. So we're inhibiting those, those muscles that are overactive. And so we're going to foam roll or, or go into lengthening. So foam roll, foam roll or, or foam roll. And we like the, and, um, to, to try to realign the tissue that is overactive. And again, when we tell people that we're trying to stretch a muscle and we're talking about static stretching, it stresses people out because they're like, but if you read research, static stretching is so bad and blah, 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 blah. If you have a muscle that's overactive, all you're trying to do is stretch it back to its normal link tension relationship. Again, normal. You're not trying to go past. You're not trying to overextend something. You're trying to realign the joints. So therefore you're going to move the way, again, you're supposed to move. And so we do inhibit and lengthen on the overactive muscles. And then after that, we activate the muscles that were shown to be underactive. So again, when we talked about the intrinsic core stabilizers, when we talked about the um, hamstrings as well as the glute max. So we would spend time focusing on those. And we're going to show you some examples of what we do. And then we go into integration. And again, what we're trying to do is now we're trying to take the lower body and upper body and do a movement pattern that integrates everything together. And so we're retraining the brain on this newfound alignment and this new found activation. Because again, the reason why um, compensations occur is your brain now thinks that that's the new norm for you. And so it lives in a compensated world and you're trying to retrain your programming system, which is your brain that no, that's wrong. This is actually how we need you to move. And you're just going to have to continuously do it over and over until that happens. Yep. Absolutely. And you know, the thing about the, the model is we love it and it's, it, you know, some people think, Oh, well, it's not fun. It's not sexy. It, it can absolutely be a great workout. It's just, we're going over the very specific patterning that shows the best results, but don't feel that when you look at this continuum, you can't put someone through a very fun, interesting workout and appropriate. It's just, you need to follow these steps to elicit the best response because I always view it as my body's like a computer, whatever mm -hmm. software I put in it, that's what it's going to run. So if I allow compensation, I'm going to get better at compensation. Yes. I might burn more calories. Yes. You might get bigger biceps from it, but at what cost? So, you know, you, this is just the research, the evidence that shows this is how you improve movement. And for a lot of you that aren't comfortable yet with this whole process and how to speak to clients, what I always say is 
you know, after you do your assessment and, you know, we never say, oh, you move horribly. We never talk like that. It's like, hey, here's some things we're going to work on. And I tie it to their goal. We're, so we're talking about the anterior tilt. So, you know, I say, hey, Wendy, as I showed you, you got a little tilt in your pelvis, very common. I know you have a goal of running a 5K. So we're going to work on, I'd go through this. And here's why. If I can get your pelvis back to neutral, that low back pain that you get from time to time. Or as a runner, we need your glutes firing so you don't get that knee pain. So if you can tie the science to why they came in, now you give them a reason why to follow it. But if you don't explain it sometimes, you know, they may not understand the nuances to it and really appreciate what you're offering that you're really giving them the best solution that's out there. Absolutely. And, and you know what, Marty, I'm actually going to read. Um, there was, uh, you know, now that, that Princess isn't here, we're kind of taking over the show. But Melanie had a question, and yeah. I think actually you're going to be able to provide a good answer for this. But she said, I have a very short torso and long legs. I feel that some of these factors automatically put me in an anterior pelvic tilt. I have also, or I also have very limited thoracic mobility, even though I work on it constantly. I try to do a lot of hip extension work and try to limit or be wary of excessive flexion work. I also feel that my core stability is decent. So what would you say to her? Excellent. So Melanie, first of all, you're on the right track without question about what you're working on. So let's take a step back and talk about, you know, the biomechanical issues. What you're saying may or may not be true. And what I mean by that is by and large, the majority of us are put together within a few percentage points of each other. You know, there are biomechanical abnormalities where somebody may be a percent or two, you know, and fill in the blank when it comes to the orthopedic issues. Sometimes, uh, like leg length discrepancies and that, sometimes it does back comes, it comes back to muscular dysfunction because if you're rotated one way or this or that, the other, you know, it, under x-ray, you might be the same, but when we watch somebody functionally, it's truly muscular. So my first thing, and this is me knowing this content, I've told Wendy, I said, you know what? I've worked on my, what I can control as much as possible, but I need to find a therapist, a manual therapist and or somebody who can get eyes on me and see things maybe I can't. And sometimes you just truly need some deep soft tissue type work where you might need a massage therapist or a physical therapist, athletic trainer to go in there and get those joints moving better. Because when we look at this model here, inhibit, I can't foam roll everything. I know that foam rolling that I can do myself keeps me moving really, really well. But if I have the desire to get to that next level, I may have to do some manual therapy with a, someone who knows this because maybe it's a, a muscle that's a little bit deeper and maybe it just is something that I haven't been able to get to myself. But even if that's the case, I want to control what I can control. Let's say you're doing everything perfect and you do have a shorter torso, torso to your longer legs. We can't control that. But what you can control is what you're doing. Get a second opinion to make sure everything's moving well. But at the end of the day, if there's certain exercises that biomechanically don't feel good to you, like I will personally, speaking for myself, never do a barbell loaded squat anymore because I think I did them for so long and it could be biomechanical or I'm just not around a good manual therapist that can free me up that last little bit. I will always have a slight anterior pelvic tilt. Okay, I accept that. I won't barbell squat, but I'll do ball squats with a weighted vest, with dumbbells. I'll do other things, step ups where now I can control my five kinetic chain checkpoints, put absolutely no pressure on my lumbar spine, and I can elicit a better response in the right movement patterns than I could if I was trying to fudge through a barbell squat where I know biomechanically I'm letting things change because that exercise doesn't work for me. So I'm not giving up on that whole phase of training and things like that. I just find a workaround but I'm also in the back of my mind going, you know what? Maybe this is something that I can't control 100% myself. And if it's that important to me, I'll find someone like Wendy or any of my other colleagues at NASM that are allowed to go in there and do the manual therapy. And on occasion, that might be what I need to get a little bit of cleanup. So, Wendy, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. The only thing, Melanie, I would say is, again, you know, for me personally, too, it's hard for me to identify what my compensations are. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, and again, when I first started teaching for NASM, I'm like, oh, I have a fantastic squat and I can do this and look at all these like amazing power things I can do or whatever. And then I had like reality hit me in the face when someone did my actual overhead squat and said, check, 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 check. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Like, you know, I roll, I strengthen my butt, I do this, I, you know, but I wasn't really doing it the way, I thought I was doing it perfectly. And then when I actually had a, a trainer train me, 
and say, well, you know what? Yeah, you're right here, but you really need to engage this more. Or I need you to, you know, in your plank, flatten your back out, go into protraction and, and retraction in your chin, you know, protra protraction of the, the uh, shoulders a little bit, retraction of the chin, squeeze your glutes, you know, your heels are touching. Um, little things like that, I didn't really mm -hmm. know I was doing, even though I could feel the exercise, I felt it working the way that it was intended to work. I, I felt it being targeted in my glutes when I did a bridge. So I would say, even though, you know, you're, you're a great trainer, I'm sure. I know you have get, got the education. You even wrote it on here, which I think is fantastic. But sometimes having someone analyze you kind of is a wake up call. Because even in our workshops, we have multiple trainers come from all over the country to, to do a workshop with us, which we love. But it's like trainers have a really, um, when they do their overhead squat, they know what we're looking for and they can't compensate or, or, or try to weasel their way out of that compensation. And mm -hmm. so, and then doing a true phase one with specific cueing and specific execution, they're dying after that. And, and again, these are trainers that are, are NASM certified. They've read the material. So, so I would just say, if you're really still struggling with this and you feel that, you know, I don't know if it's a torso leg discrepancy. I mean, it absolutely could be as Marty said, but I think also having a trainer that is very, you know, very good at identifying um, compensations in an assessment. If you could team up with that person um, just to get a second opinion on your movement patterns that maybe you might not see, I think that's also uh, could be super helpful. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And that's the one thing I miss about traveling right now, because you know, whenever we were together, you know, I'd be like, Hey, Wendy, you know, what do you see? Like, what's my external rotation? And, you know, because one, we're passionate about it, but two, we also understand the value of a new set of eyes as well as there's just things we cannot see on ourselves. So absolutely. Yep. And then, um, Tom, actually, Marty, before we move on, had a yep. question, follow up with Melanie's question. So just, we'll keep going on this. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of clients that are taller and we train for powerlifting. They struggle to get into it proper position and form with conventional deadlifts. We work on freeing up the front of the hip flexors and work on strengthening the glutes and overall flexibility. What else can help? Excellent. Great question, Tom. So there's a lot to it. So, you know, I'm going to make some assumptions. So if someone's going right to deadlifts, that is, you know, more advanced exercise progression. So clearly you might have given them a ton of progressions to get to that point. So really, you know, things that Wendy and I would do is obviously exactly what you're saying. We're going to inhibit what we can inhibit TFL, especially we're going to do all the static stretching. We're going to get into glute activation, core stabilization, but really we're going to do a lot of different bridging patterns because we need to get those hips learning how to get into extension. And then from there, you know, there's also uh, other things that you can do to learn that patterning of deadlifting. Now, I want to make sure here when you talk about deadlifting, I don't know if you're talking about loaded deadlifts or just the deadlift movement itself. Because if someone can't get into that movement pattern unloaded in that stabilization phase, then we know we're not ready to move into that loaded position yet. So sometimes it could be that maybe they just need to spend more time in stabilization. And little things like there's a ton of exercise and I'll ask Wendy maybe what some of her favorites are, but you know, you know, like st even standing Cobras and things like that, where you're teaching people how to get into somewhat of a modified deadlift position and holding that position for periods of time before you'd ever have them come in and come out of it. That's one thing that I like to do. And I know Wendy, you've got a lot of different sequences you do to help teach that deadlift pattern. I do. I mean, again, it's like, are they hip hinging correctly? I mean, that's mm -hmm. step one, because again, it is a movement pattern. And so you want to make sure again, unloaded and, and making sure again, can they maintain proper alignment? You know, a big thing with deadlifters, especially or, or people that deadlifters, you like that people that deadlift, <laughs> that's my, my term for people that just, that's all they do. Okay. Um, but, uh, but people that, that do deadlifts a lot, you know, and they're looking up at their form. Again, we talked about the, the reflex between the eyes and the pelvis. If you look up, you will put them into an anterior pelvic mm -hmm. tilt because that's the way that the hips shift in order to maintain proper balance and alignment. And so, um, so again, making sure that the five kinetic chain checkpoints are maintained, you know, and again, this is just starting out on the movement pattern and prep on positioning of the head, the spine, as well as making sure they come into full hip extension on the way up. And then at that point, can they do it single leg? So then I love doing the single leg. Well, I do bridges first after that. And so once they've got the hip hinge, I do bridges, making sure we get activation. And then I like to do the single leg Romanian deadlifts. 
Um, can they do those correctly? Again, where they're relying more on their stabilizers to control the movement too. And so we know we've got the prime movers working. We know that we've got the stabilizers. And then at that point, you can progress them to the bar. And that's something that you could do even as a pattern to get them warmed up if they don't have time to go through phases, you know, one, two, you know, before they even get to what would be, you know, probably phase three, which I'm guessing, you know, three, four or five, depending on what, how you're doing your deadlifts and the tempo and, 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 uh, and positioning. So I don't know if that helps, but um, if there's anything that we can help even more with, just let us know. Um, that was a great question. Um, mm -hmm. But again, a lot of times guys, you know, we think that we're, we're ready for an exercise, especially a powerlifting exercise when we didn't really spend the, the foundational time in, in phase one that's needed in order to execute a true power lift with correct, you know, explosion, powerful, powerful movements, as well as positioning. Yep. Excellent. And I see, you know, um, what we'll do is maybe answer this one question here from Sylvester before we jump in, because we're talking about the corrective exercise uh, continuum. So Sylvester asked a question about stretching and it confuses them a little bit that should you stretch before, after deadlifts or in between sets? And you're learning, you know, that he's learning, which is awesome. Loving the webinar. So great. Thanks for that feedback. So Sylvester, I'm going to go back to what I said about the model. If you're new to NASM or haven't taken it yet, this is exactly what we teach. All of those decisions are brought out in our education. So I grew up in the gym and I'd see people, you know, stretching in between sets and, you know, maybe not even knowing why they would do it. They would just do it because. So when you look at this evidence-based model, this is showing what the science says is the best way to elicit an amazing or the best response. So when you're looking at deadlifting, let's assume that you're more in the strength phase and you're lifting weights while you're deadlifting. If we go right back into that static stretching that Wendy talked about, we are purposely now trying to shut down muscle activity. So it goes against what we're trying to do in the phase of training. Now, stretch, static stretching is not a bad thing. We need to use it to elicit a response in a muscle to get it to calm down when it's working too much and it's changing our posture. But we would follow that up with more stabilization training to help them reestablish posture. We wouldn't do a strength exercise right then. So by the time they earn the right to go to the strength phase, there's no need for the static stretching anymore. And we also have a very a sound warm up where they go through their warm up technique. And in that phase, it'd be active stretching after self myofascial release, core activation. So by the time they get to their deadlifts, there's no reason to be doing those type of activities in between. So I hope that helps a little bit, but the model will answer all those questions for you when it comes to what we call your acute variables, as well as giving you the right type of warm up for each phase of training. And then the cool down as well. Yes, we're going to do our stretching techniques after all of our workouts to kind of reestablish that posture and get things to settle back down a little bit. Yeah. I and I want to... I want to kind of comment on that too. And Sylvester, when you say what you're stretching, that's another thing I want to really emphasize here, because again, if you're doing deadlifts, a lot of times people will feel that quote burn, they're actually, you know, working that muscle and they feel immediately that they need to go in and stretch that hip flexor. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the, the hamstrings mm -hmm. when in all reality, again, hopefully they have, they have gotten out of their anterior pelvic tilt. But again, that's why the assessment is so important because again, you don't want to stretch the hamstrings even though you just work them at that period of time, especially if they're very prone to an anterior pelvic tilt. You want to strengthen them for sure, but don't go in and then feel just because you just did a strengthening exercise that you need to statically stretch that muscle because that could actually um, kind of increase the compensation and then add more load and stress to the lower back. Sorry, awesome. just want to throw so, that in. <laughs> I know we'll get some more questions, but we can move forward if you like, Wendy. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about, let's, you know, now that we've kind of gone through the model and I know we're taking kind of questions sometimes as we go. Um, again, when we talk about inhibit, we want to think about, you know, foam rolling. And again, you know, we're calling it self, instead of self myofascial release, we're now calling it self myofascial technique. And mainly because we want you guys to realize that again, you're still doing a hunt and destroy mission mission. You're finding those muscles, the, the areas that are the most tender on the muscles that were found to be overactive in the assessment. And then at that point, you're going to hold and marinate on that section for about 20 to 30 seconds or until the pain is reduced. And again, I know many of you guys that have been with us forever know this, but I say this all the time. 
when people are using a foam roller or they're using, you know, different types of tools and stuff, you don't want to go back and forth crazy on that, on that area that's tender. It's not meant to be like a rolling pin where you're rolling out dough to try to, to, to get it nice and flat. What you're trying to do is you're trying to get that muscle spindle to tell the, the GTO like, Hey, everything's okay. Relax and try to, you know, try to get a little bit more like, length into that the, that's kind of the, what we're doing in static stretching you're kind of getting the same type of response a little different way in foam rolling and so you want your body to automatically try to um, get more length and so again based on the assessment of what we showed you guys being overactive we suggest that you foam roll the tfl and again think about where the tfl is and again it being in a shortened position one of your hip flexors as well as your rectus femoris your lats um, you know, again, your lats, as Marty said, think about where they attach in the lower back and then in the, you know, in the, the mid arm in the front and then the erectors. And again, when you're doing the erectors, often people, oftentimes people put the foam roller in their lower back. And the thing is, is we tell you not to do that. You are, you want to put it, the foam roller, if you want to use the foam roller on your back, put it in your thoracic spine, because that's where you want more mobility your cervical and your lumbar spine, you want more stability. So instead, you already have an anterior pelvic tilt. So meaning you already have an arch in your lower back you're trying to cue out of. So if I actually stick a foam roller in there, A, there's those bony processes that can get irritated because there's not a lot of muscle to protect that area in the lower back. But then also, you're also increasing a compensation that you're trying to cue out of. So at that point, if you want to do your erectors, you know, I would say maybe look at most the um, some of the muscle percussion devices, such as like the Hypervolt or the Theragun, something like that, to try to relax those muscles um, that, that are along the spine or get two tennis balls and put them in a sock and then just kind of nice and easily go down, but separate the spine. So therefore, there's no irritation. And again, do the same thing. Hold those tender spots 20 to 30 seconds, marinate on those areas. And once you feel that pain decrease, then you can move on to the next the next spot. Yeah. And when the, the you know, I, again, I was telling you about what goes on when I squat heavy. I still am working on trying to get out of that anterior pelvic tilt, hence my stand up desk. But, you know, I do a lot of trigger point work on my erector spine, a in my lumbar spine, but I have, you know, the trigger point ball that's separated. Mm -hmm. And the key thing is when I use it in my lumbar spine, I put myself in neutral. Mm -hmm. One, it gives me more pressure. But it also doesn't, you know, sometimes people put the ball there and they just allow it to go right into that hyperextension. So the key thing is if you are, can tolerate that, make sure that you're in neutral and not having that pressure push up and let your pelvis drop. Absolutely. And guys, remember tennis balls or balls or anything like mm -hmm. that, the smaller the implement, the deeper it goes. And so again, a tennis ball is going to be obviously a lot uh, smaller than a big foam roller. And so if, if somebody can't handle that, then at that point, maybe don't foam roll it but then spend more time doing static stretches. Cause again, what we're trying to do is elongate the tissue back to its normal position and trying to get, you know, get it to relax a little bit. So um, just wanted to kind of throw that in there. Mm -hmm. Awesome. You, you want to talk about static stretching? I mean, I guess those are kind of like the basic yeah, I mean, stretches. I think everybody understands it. You know, we're yeah. going to inhibit. And then the next thing we do is lengthen those exact same muscles. I mean, that's, yeah. that is what we're purposely trying to accomplish. So, you know, you can see that we duplicated everything right there from the foam roll into the static stretch. It's just a drop and drag. Yep. And then if we go to the next slide, then again, what we're going to spend some time on is really just talking about the underactive muscles. And so Marty identified them and talked, we talked a little bit about why and how that can cause those, uh, I'm sorry, allow those compensations to happen. So again, what we're trying to think about is now that we have the new found length and hopefully the muscles that were, you know, shown to be overactive, we really need to spend some time to activate the muscles that are underactive. So therefore we can restore the optimal link tension relationships throughout the entire lumbopelvic hip complex. Yep. Just about getting into ideal posture and then being able to maintain it yep. like while you move. That's that's such a fundamental thing that we need to do each and every day. I mean, I work on it every day. Every workout <laughs> that I go into, no matter what phase, I'm starting with this. It's just it's just that essential. Yep. I mean, that's it. So. All right. Let's um, if we talk about some of the programming. So let's talk about some of the activation exercises. Again, remember, these are the muscles that were really, you know, allowing those compensations to happen. So 
no shocking, like shocker here, like glute max, we're going to talk about the floor and ball bridge. I mean, guys, this is a fantastic exercise for pretty much anyone to do. It doesn't require any equipment. You can do it anywhere. If you can teach your client to draw in, squeeze the glutes, maintain neutral, then at that point, they should be able to really try to get more activation in your glutes. And, you know, and the big thing is, is what I always, always say when you're, when we talk about the floor bridge and I, I'm not going to make an exception on this webinar is when you're having someone do the bridge for the first time, one of the key questions as a trainer that you can ask your client is where do you feel this? Because again, if you say, Hey, do you feel this in your glutes? They're like, Oh yeah, absolutely. And they don't even know what the glutes are. Um, you know, again, they don't know that it's terms glutes or something, but if you say, Hey, point to where you feel this. And if you see that your client is pointing to their hamstrings, this exercise is not intended to be a hamstring exercise. And that's what, you know, even though the hamstrings are shown to be obviously underactive as well, this should be a glute max exercise. Because what we're trying to do is go into flexion and extension of the hip. And so when you're thinking about that, think about even, you know, reciprocal inhibition. As you flex the hip, the glutes should, should contract. Um, and then vice versa, as you... Um, uh, you know, bring your hips, to, or, I'm sorry, as you flex the hips, you're lengthening the glutes. And then as you come up into extension and you lengthen the hips, the, the glutes should work. And so that's basically what you're doing is you're retraining again, the brain on how to, to work with reciprocal inhibition. And remember reciprocal inhibition is as one muscle shortens, the other one has to lengthen on the opposing side. The hamstrings are a synergist to the glutes. So as soon as you say, where do you feel this? And they point to their hamstrings. That means their glutes are not doing their job and they're having their synergist um, the, the synergists do the work for them. And so that's where you need to cue out of it. The easiest way to cue out of it, bring your heels back towards your glutes and therefore have them re realign themselves again in the five kinetic chain checkpoints and see if that, if that actually gets them out of it. And so, um, you know, but then at that point, um, you know, we would go into the ball hamstring curl and Marty, do you want to kind of talk about that? Yeah, there's a lot of different ways that you can, you know, get the hamstrings activated. Yeah, Wendy said, why well, we don't want to overstretch them. If this is the movement compensation you have, you're really trying to strengthen them because they are going to bring that pelvis back to a more neutral position. They're going to fight the action of the hip flexor. So okay. we like the, the ball bridge, but there's even a time and a place that sometimes I might use a seated leg curl where they can see their legs in front of them. I have, if I have to, sometimes they can't control this yet. So that's okay. You know, I'm not always a big fan of isolated strengthening exercises, but in corrective exercise, that's what we may need sometimes. The key thing is to get those hamstrings stronger so it fights that willingness of the pelvis to tip forward. Absolutely. And then again, we talked about the intrinsic core stabilizers. Guys, there's so many core exercises that we like love. Um, we, we usually talk about the uh, planks, especially during the anterior tilt, because again, you can see what's happening at their back pretty easy as a trainer when they go into a plank to see if there's any arching that's happening throughout. One thing that I will tell you that's a very common exercise, especially in phase one, is a bird dog. And I would tell you just to be weary of that in the very beginning with someone with an anterior pelvic tilt. Um, the reason being is obviously their lats are also um, overactive. And so if they don't have the extensibility yet in their lats, even though you're working on it, then as soon as you have them bring their arm overhead and then you have them extend the leg, sometimes you can get more of an anterior tilt until you really have gotten good activation throughout the lumbopelvic hip complex first. So that might be more of a little bit of a progression, even though it's not a progressed exercise, just know that there's a lot of common compensations that happen if you immediately put them into a bird dog. So I just wanted to throw that out there. All right, so let's go to the, the next, um, yeah, next slide. I guess, you know, again, when we think about the CES continuum, and remember, guys, the CES continuum follows the same thing that we do in the CPT. So you foam roll, you stretch, you do your core balance and reactive, and then you go into total body. So again, integration would just be your total body exercise. <laughs> Marty and I's favorite, squat to row. Um, no shocker there. Again, really trying to get good activation of the glutes full hip extension and making sure when they go into the row that they're, they've got um, no internal rotation of the shoulders, their head stays and maintains neutral. Um, we've talked about the single leg Romanian deadlift. Again, I use that as progression. A PNF pattern is just like if you're thinking of an X, you know, then you're just bringing one side up, making that one side of an X pattern as they come up. 
Um, and then again, just a single leg chest press. Again, can they maintain good alignment? Can they go into um, you know a good chest pattern without going into an arching as their hands go forward? So you can choose any ones that you want. These are just some that that we like, and uh, you know we use often. Absolutely, great choices. <laughs> Why do you want to talk about the key takeaways? Yeah. So there was one other question that I saw that I definitely want to address that came in earlier about, but then we'll get to key takeaways about the use of uh, weightlifting belts during exercise. And the reason that uh, I'm going to talk about this, I actually, when I was doing my doctorate, I actually wrote a research paper on it now. So the research is a few years older, but I think it's, fair, it's still going to be relevant. I grew up in the gym where you had to have a weight belt, even go get a drink of water. Like that was what guys did. Right. You know, it's we, for chest press, we had a weight bench or belt. So the key thing is if someone's in stabilization training, I am building their internal weight belt. They should not need one by any means. And really when you look at activating the transverse abdominis, and this was some of the interesting research that I found is we need to draw in to activate our transverse abdominis. The studies now show when people have a weight belt on, they push into it, they brace. So they're actually, if you think about reciprocal inhibition, if drawing in activates the transverse abdominis, what would be pushing out? getting the transverse abdominis to shut off. So you're getting people a false sense of core stability. And then you're also giving them sometimes a false sense of security. So there was a study that came out about all the employees at like a Home Depot and Lowe's. Mm -hmm. Remember back in the day, everyone, they gave everybody that little vest with the weight belt, injury rates went up. And then now you walk through Lowe's and Home Depot, they don't have them anymore. So the, a lot of the studies was showing that people had a false sense of security for sure. Plus it changed the patterning. So we want to build that internal core stabilization mechanism ourselves. And then by the time again, we get to the phase of strength training, maybe they wouldn't need it. Now, if you're going extremely heavy in max strength, that's a decision you and your athlete. And I say, everyone's an athlete have to make. The key thing is by that point, they should know how to use a belt properly, where if they're using it, they're still drawing in. I mm -hmm. would absolutely not let someone use the belt and then not be focused on neutral spine in that drawing in maneuver. Cause now I'm going against everything that we know from human anatomy. So that's my best advice is don't go to it too quick. And if you're going to use it, it should only be at the peak, 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 heavy max strength. Because if you need it other than that, then they have other issues they need to work on. And when they're using it, make sure they're still going through as if they have their own internal weight belt. Mm -hmm. so. Wanted to address that. When do you got anything on that one? No, I mean, I think it's perfect. I mean, I personally don't use them at all with any of my clients. I mean, mm -hmm. even on their one rep max day, um, just because again, I want to see what's happening exactly. And I don't want to miss something. And I think sometimes a belt can hide that. And yep. I don't, you know, because again, if you have one, one small shift or something happens and they're in an anterior tilt and you have them doing a one rep, one rep max lift, um, it could increase injury. And I don't want to end up having some, you know, having some issue in the lower back just due to, to something that I might have, I might've missed. Correct. So, but again, all to their own, that's the beauty of, of training. You know, you know, your client, you know what you're comfortable with and, and then you want to go from there. Yeah. Um, so. Cool. So kind of my key takeaways is, as I always say, the model has all the answers there for you. Sometimes they're still hidden to you because you have to learn how to find where all those answers would be in a sense. But, you know, a couple questions came in today is like, well, use the model, use the model, use the model. So your assessments, your phases of training, the acute variables, exercise progressions, that is always going to be my biggest key takeaway. And that's why Wendy and I've been doing this for 15 plus years now. So because it works so beautifully and the research has always shown that this is the best training program system that's ever been designed. And we can say that from now 20 plus years of research. Yes. And I'm going to, I'm going to agree. I mean, I think again, you know what, the assessments are key. I say that every, every single session, I will do it until the day I die, because if you don't have an assessment, you truly don't know what your client has the capability of. You don't understand their movement patterns and you don't know if they're setting realistic goals. And so again, the anterior pelvic tilt, um, you know, is, or also extension intolerance. When you think about that, um, 
It is a very common compensation. It is extremely painful, painful for people that have had discomfort for so, so long. And that's, I think, the beauty of being a personal trainer. You can actually help these people by identifying that and then knowing the key areas to address, whether it's foam rolling, lengthening, um, you know, going through the activation and then trying to get them to move into the right things properly. Um, there was one quick question that was just a follow up, I think, that came in. I think I think it was Taylor that asked about, again, the foam rollers and the lower back and that she read, don't do that. And I absolutely agree. So just to reiterate what I said earlier, don't put a foam roller in your lower back. I would use something like a tennis ball or a lacrosse ball or some other type of implement where it kind of keeps you in a neutral position, as Marty said, and also helps kind of get some of the the. Um, you know, the lengthening that you're trying to, to get or the inhibition that you're trying to get throughout the erector spinae when you're doing that. Um, another thing too, again, think about the implement. The harder the implement, the deeper it goes. So a tennis ball is going to be a little bit easier than a lacrosse ball. Um, but again, even a tennis ball might be too much. So you may have to look into some other types of, of things that you can use, or if nothing is working um, and everything seems too deep, then just go into statically stretching the erectors to start until you can at least get a little more length back into them to where you can then start to do the right inhibition um, techniques that you're trying to, to uh, do for the erectors. But, um, but yeah, so that's, that's it. <laughs> That was a lot. I was trying to hurry because I know we're over time. So <laughs> I think we have time for the one last question from Sylvester. So the question is how safe or dangerous are dumbbell side bends for your lower back or your hips? And when should you do them? So I'll give my answer. And obviously I'd love to hear from Wendy. That's not an exercise I do. I don't do loaded frontal plane side bends because there's other ways I can work my obliques. And when I look at the compressive forces on those discs, when I load that, especially when people are grabbing 25, 40, 50, you know, pound dumbbells, not something I tend to do. A lot of people don't even have the flexibility and range of motion to do that, let alone how to understand it. And that's, you know, those muscles that are in there. Yes, you would be getting some of your obliques, but you're also getting some other muscles deep within your spine, your QL for one, quadratus lumborum that tend to be overactive. So that's not something that uh, I've ever done. Wendy, do you uh, agree, disagree? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't usually do those either. Um, and, and the reason being, well, let me take two steps back. If you're going to do them and you're going to follow the model, then, you know, we say don't go into flexion, extension or bending or movement of the spine until you get to your strength phases, because you want to make sure that the stabilizers and everything and in, in your core is dialed in. And again, remember the core is 29 muscles that protect the spine. If you've got them all firing and everything properly lined up, then you're going to be able to execute things properly. Um, to Marty's point, there is a lot of compression that you are putting on when you're doing the side to side frontal plane things. However, if you wanted to still kind of still work those muscles and maybe not put as much torque or tweak on them by going downward motion side to side, then what I would tell you to do is maybe do a cable chop or cable lift. Because again, you're still, instead of going directly side to side, you're still moving the rotators and you're also um, working your um uh, your obliques um, and getting a lot of benefit out of it. And it may be a little bit safer on your body. However, if you love it and you want to do it and it's something that you're passionate about and you can do it safely and there's no issues, then go for it. Because again, just we, because we don't do it doesn't mean it, that you should never do it. What I've done to solve for that problem for me is I'll do farmer carries or one arm farmer carries right. because now I'm in neutral and that's more likely what I'm going to be doing in real life anyways. And I've had people that are really fit. I'll have maybe a 30 pound dumbbell on one hand, 15 pound in the other, then I switch or one arm farmer carries. But the key thing is, can they get neutral and maintain their normal stride patterns? You see people doing farmer carries and they're shrugging and they're shuffling. Again, unless they're doing a strongman competition where it's, hey, can you move this to that point? Different story. But so those are some ways that I get around it and still activate those patterning, but I don't load it in that side flex bend position. Yep. I do farmer carries too. Those are, I like those a lot. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Well, here's our contact information coming up next. Yes. So, so if you guys want to contact me, you can always email me at wendy.bats at nasm.org, or you can find me on Instagram at wendy.bats13. And then for me, my email, marty.miller at nasm.org. Then Instagram, dr.martymiller72. And then I'll give a shameless plug on Friday mornings at 6 a.m. I do a coffee talk just to kind of answer. Wendy, it's not about me. It's to answer these type of questions. So I'm on Instagram live and then Tuesdays at 930. So you can always check in there and start firing off some questions there as well.
but it's not my Instagram. It's NASM's Instagram. <laughs> That's perfect. Well, we want to thank you guys so much for joining us today. We have had such a good time. Again, Marty and I can talk about this for hours and hours just because we're super passionate about it. We know that it's something that, that trainers have struggled with in the past, and we know that you guys can make a unbelievable dis difference in your clients' lives if you can identify it, you know, the correct way of, of helping them get out of this discomfort as well as moving properly. So as we we say our goodbyes, we want to thank Greg, the producer in the back end, um, as Marty failed to do in the beginning. Um, but I also want to thank Marty Miller, as always, for his <laughs> unbelievable, uh, you know, uh, just, I don't Great know. His, yeah, he's, he's a super smart dude, guys. He makes me look smart every day. So <laughs> <laughs> You're so kind, Wendy. It goes the same way, both ways. All right. Well, thank you guys very much.